Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Muscle podcast. Now a couple of shows ago I had an excellent interview on training the older athlete with Robert Linkle who at the end of my podcast here's a, here's a spoiler alert for you Rick I always ask who should I interview next and one of the first names that came out of his mouth was Rick Howard wow. yeah, and, and then like you start going tell me what a great guy you were so nothing to live up you know nothing to live up to here but he has <laughs> no. set expectations very high but I'm uh, delighted to uh, to welcome Rick Howard to the show Rick how's things? Things are great. Uh, thanks, Tom. I really appreciate being here and the uh, high praise from Robert. That's a lot to live up to. Well, exactly. Yeah, he, he's set a very high expectations here. No, but he, 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 I mean, we had a great episode. I really enjoyed chatting to him um, and it opened my eyes up to, to a few different things in terms of the, the, the people I tend to work with. And I think we're going to get, as I said off air, that here because what we're really going to focus on today is long term uh, athlete development or I believe LTAD is that kind of the, that, you know, L, L, rather than LTAD, what, what, I'm not sure what the preferred acronym is there, but, but we're looking at that now. I don't work with, you know, well, anyone other than adults currently. So obviously mm -hmm. not an area of expertise for, for myself, but something that you're one of the real go-to guys for. Um, so first of all, could you, you know, could you define what, long-term athletic development is what it what it really means uh, because i'm sure there's plenty of misconceptions which maybe we'll address uh, in a few moments well i think it's a great place to start because i think getting back to robert's presentation how he trains the older adult a lot of what he does with older adults is probably because uh, they didn't get what they needed when they were younger so we really look at long-term athletic development as a cradle to grave framework or how to get people to be active at the particular level where they are at that time, but from early childhood all the way into late, late, late adulthood. So the earlier models that came out really focused on sports participation and sporting excellence. So it was really a model that focused primarily on youth. Um, one of the models that I worked on actually was very youth centric in terms of what we did with it. But the more we looked at it, we're like, you know what, if you really don't get this to be a cradle to grave concept, we're really missing the boat on getting people to be active. But we recognize that start with the kids. If you can get them active now, then they'll be active through their lives and then hopefully we can catch everybody else along the way. Yeah, okay, brilliant. So that's one of the uh, misconceptions there's right, right there. Because uh, when I was doing sports science, uh, it was very much, as you said, youth athletes. Um, uh, bringing them through development, maybe uh, over here thinking about academies for the football team, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, or, or tennis seemed to be at the time really big on it at the time. But but yeah, I was going to say when's when's the entry and exit point? Well, the, the, there isn't really an exit point uh, as long as as long as you're alive, uh, then you, mm -hmm. you, you're sort of in the framework. That's a really good point too, because that's what happened. You know, all the alarming statistics showing that seventy percent of kids drop out of sports used to be by age 13. The recent data is starting to indicate that that is trending toward age 11. Wow. So they're starting earlier and dropping out earlier. And, and so then they become sedentary. So it's not like, oh, I'm dropping out of sports. I'm going to go do this now. You know, they, they identified with that sport at that period of time. And for those who played only one sport, they never really learned the skills they needed to be physically active or what we might consider athletic. So if they don't play that sport anymore, they don't really know what to do and they just stop playing altogether. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite scary um, to think that people are leaving uh, you know, that early is, mm -hmm. I, I guess they're, they're busy with their Xbox or PlayStation or whatever it is. Now all of a sudden there's, there's uh, you know, the screen time, the smartphone, the, the, the tablet is, is winning that battle. Um, well, so we've got to, you know, got to try and reverse that trend. Uh, now, the other thing, again, getting back to, so if we go with some of the, the things that, I think of when I hear uh, the, the long-term athlete development kind of terminology thrown around again and back, back to, to my background is um, I think when I saw it, a lot of the coaches that were involved in it actually seemed to be basically trying to, to do like early specialization and uh, making really good sports people. And there was a heavy focus on maybe the technical and tactical aspects of whatever sport they happen to be coaching. So it wasn't, it didn't seem like we're developing athletes. It was more, we're trying to develop a, a sports person who has skills in this sport that aren't necessarily transferable. Whereas it seems to make more sense if we can give them a broad base of athletic abilities, they mm -hmm. then can all transfer, that all those abilities will transfer across to various sports. Um, it, I, I, from my understanding, that awareness of that seems to be becoming more the norm, more widespread. Is, is that fair? Is that true? Or there's still people that are really hammering the early specialization stuff? 
you know, it's really interesting because it's the, the latest craze now is FOMO, fear of missing out. And so what's really happening is that, you know, even though the data indicate that what we really should be doing is giving all of our kids a really wide berth of opportunities to be physically active and to participate in sports. So, you know, some people say, well, don't do the sports just as long as you're moving, everything's fine. And it, no, it's a great balance between all three of those, but there's still that mentality out there because a lot of, like you'd mentioned the academies or here in the United States are travel teams. So if, we're not making money selling more travel teams. We don't have our business anymore. We need to keep those kids engaged to keep dollars coming in. So we don't know a different way of doing it. And so then the parents buy in because they want, they're really just trying to get the best opportunity for their kids. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not saying, you know what, mine's the best six year. Well, they probably are saying that to some degree, but they really want to have the best opportunity for their kids to participate and be active and to have fun. So this is what they think they have to do just to keep up so that they don't miss out. So even though the, the research and other information will tell them differently, that you get caught up in that process and it's really hard uh, to get back out of that because there are not a lot of other opportunities where you have a diversified sports experience. Interesting. So for example, my kids, uh, as I mentioned, are fair, they're five and seven at school. They do PE once a week for about an hour, like in terms of the organized structure. Now we have them doing stuff on the weekend after mm -hmm. school and we're trying to encourage them, you know, like, yeah, as much as possible, be out and about and doing things. Um, is that a similar situation? I mean, I suppose the States is so vast that it may be different from area to area, but as a general rule, is, is that how it is? It's just one day a week for an hour or so um, at schools? It's a universal problem right now. So it's an international, almost epidemic uh, um, in terms of physical activity, physical education, uh, how our society really values being active. We don't. So, you know, when you, you look at all these things and something has to go in the school budget, I'm like, all right, phys ed, out it goes, recess, out it goes. So all these opportunities that we know kids really need because it helps them to stay engaged in school helps them to be healthy and to develop those healthy habits for a lifetime. So if we tell our kids that we're gonna cut recess or we're gonna cut out sports programs or we're gonna reduce physical education programs, we're telling them we don't value your fitness, your wellness and your health as a society. We want you to stick to the books, uh, go out to your travel team and that's what we really value for you, you're eight. So you know, we're really sending the wrong message to the kids on the other hand, I think physical education has kind of gone through all these different transformations that, you know, it used to just be basically, and there are, there are long-term athletic development models that are talent identification models from physical education class. Pick out the best students in PE, those are the ones that go to the academy. That doesn't work because we know the nature of growth and development. You can't possibly predict at age eight, nine, or 10, who's going to be on your elite team later. So to pick them out then is not uh, developmentally appropriate, as, as we would say. But on the other side of that, kids aren't getting well-rounded experiences in physical education, largely because those who are making the decisions for how much phys ed they get and what they look like didn't really have good experiences. You know, there's been a lot of articles, unfortunately, about, you know, people's worst experiences in school. And quite often it was in phys ed. Because, you know, if you think about it too, like you don't get called up to the board in math class to work that problem out in front of your, your friends, your parents, the community, and you know you mess up and everybody's yelling at you, but that's what we do in sports. It's a whole different context. So we don't realize what that does to kids if we're not giving them that positive experience to make that happen. So when we go back and look at it that way, we really need to add to physical education for the whole child. It's not just sports, uh, it's not just games, and it's not just physical fitness because physical fitness doesn't really mean anything to a kid, you know? No kid comes up and says, hey coach, you know, I'm, I'm eight years old and I'm really worried about my risk of cardiovascular disease. What program do you have for me? You know, but we look at it from that adult mentality that we're trying to reduce the risk of low back pain. We're trying to reduce the risk of uh, early heart attack and premature death and all that. Kids wanna have fun. They can get yes. that, but you know, there's a way we can create these programs where kids get to be involved and engaged and have fun without having to be so strict and only fitness oriented. Yes, it made me think um, as you were talking there uh, about what fun, uh, variety, uh, and you know, just their general enjoyment uh, being a key thing. And, and as someone who like, I really enjoyed sport as a kid, but I can still remember like 
I was weak as anything. We had to do the shot put. And I still remember the embarrassment as I'd sort of my arm would travel and yet the shot put seemed to be behind my arm and it just dropped in front of me. And that was mm-hmm. as someone who, who was, you know, re, not necessarily athletically gifted, but, you know, enjoyed sport. So I'm mm-hmm. sure there'll be lots of other kids who found that far more uh, embarrassing and upsetting. Um, and, and so, I, yeah, I think the other thing that came across there was I imagine there's coaches out there making the mistake of maybe just treating these kids like mini adults and, and trying mm-hmm. to train them in, in that respect, as opposed to how can we get them to engage this for the sake of physical activity uh, and just part, you know, part of the process and, and, and build positive um, connections and habits that they, they then take and they'll run with that literally. I mean, uh, you know, go, go on to, to find the sport that really suits them and in time yeah. uh, and, and perhaps excel. So, mm-hmm. uh, okay, so you know, as, as a parent who wants their kids to be uh, physically active but have a good relationship with that, um, obviously making it fun and, and is one thing, but uh, you know, what, what should I be thinking about when I'm like, okay, we, you know, as I said, we're not getting much at school. So now me or, or, um, or the coaches, if they go off and do some sports clubs, we're essentially like the PE teacher all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. And, and as someone who's done homeschooling, being the teacher of your own kid can be quite challenging. So mm-hmm. how can, how can, any practical takeaways of things I can do that make it fun, but also I know that I'm getting, you know, getting what they need out of it. So some, you know, I, I'd be thinking, well, I probably want some foundation, foundational movement patterns involved somehow, but, but, right. you know, telling them we're going to do some, some lunges or some squats, they're not buying into that. How can, how can I get that happening? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I suppose it's when I used to coach rugby, I'd call it camouflage conditioning because the guys, they would they were playing rugby to enjoy these were adults but they didn't want to come and get do fitness work but they needed it so mm-hmm. how do i weave that in to, to some fun sure that, that's a great question because that's really what it's all about and i think if there's anything that um our new teachers that we have in our communities who are our parents at home with the kids now they've, you've really realized it is not an easy task i was really um, excited when we started to have some of the shutdowns how many parents i saw outside with their kids it lasted about two weeks. And I said, "All right, everybody, back inside." That was too. That was too much to think about. Uh, let you know, go back on your your video games, your computers, or whatever else it is. But what a great opportunity! Because at that age, parents are the role models. So what are you, what you know? What are you doing to show that you're being active and valuing that? Uh, we always joke around that parents now in in youth sports are chauffeurs and cheerleaders. They they take the kids everywhere. They well, you hope they're cheering, but they're usually yelling instead. But you know you want them to be an active part of that, and they're really not. So how are parents being active and showing kids how much fun it can be? It might take a little bit of work because the research indicates that uh, muscle strength and like you mentioned, the motor skill development is huge. So knowing what some of those things are, um, you know, when I was a kid, my father would race me around the block, and it wasn't until I was probably like 10 or 11 years old that I finally figured out that he was cutting through halfway around the block because I finally got far enough along to see where he was going. But, you know, it, it really meant a lot to me that he valued it enough to, to keep me active and doing different stuff. So, you know, just different relays, fun, you know, the, the thing for kids to get fast, chase and be chased. So, you know, what mm-hmm. kind of tag games can you create? What kind of obstacles can you do? And, you know, we always say that all those really cool tools are reserved for our top level athletes. Kids love that sort of stuff. You know, like any type of of mats you could put out, any obstacles to run over, jump over, crawl under, all of those primary movements that, you know, now people are making tons of money promoting animal movements. Like, wow, really? (laughs) So, you know, all the stuff that we used to always get when we were kids, but a lot of it was because we got to go outside and learn about that not just in a structured environment, but in an unstructured environment by ourselves. So we don't give kids time to do that. We don't give them time to be in their own age group sets to learn these things because everything has to be so controlled and watched over that kids really miss out on a lot of those opportunities that way. Yeah, so um, um, a sign of where where we are now. Um, One question I spoke, well, two questions that came out. So first thing you you mentioned like role models. Um, and I think as far as the kids are concerned, a uh, really key, key takeaway, you know, the, the more you evaluate how you're getting on as a parent is they, they do what you do, not what you say. So mm-hmm. if you're setting that example uh, and, and you know, being active yourself and engaging in trying to do that, that that's, I think, for, from my point of view, has been 
critical with whatever you're trying to get buy-in on and trying to encourage them to do um, and that's that's a really uh, important thing but I suppose that the flip side of that is if you're always on your phone and staring at your phone guess what they want to be on mm -hmm. their iPad or using your phone to play a game or whatever so um, and, and, and as the, you know I think all, almost all parents are guilty of it to some extent and it's just just trying to shift stuff I've certainly had that mm -hmm. um, and then the other one you mentioned structured you know, getting outside and playing and then the structure stuff so what's what's the rate uh, the balance that we want to strike here because i think to some extent part of me feels like oh you know kids should be able to just get out and play and mm -hmm. uh, and explore and that will that will teach them a lot of stuff but uh, but another part of me is thinking oh that might mean that come 15 when or you know, whatever when sort of puberty hits or whatever they might have a gap in what they didn't develop because mm -hmm. you know no no one was kind of taking them on that journey no you know uh taking just being one chapter ahead i suppose and just saying all right you can do this now try this and like like in any other in any other subjects at school for example you would like to think the teacher's like you can do this and they just dangle the next thing that's a little bit about reach and they get to that and they progress mm -hmm. whereas if if we take perhaps the lazy approach of just go and play maybe that does that have some downsides yeah, you know, in, in education in general, they call it scaffolding, like taking that skill and then building the next level on it. Uh, when you mentioned earlier that we have this adult model of our youth sports program, we're looking for the U10 champions. So rather than actually having them build all of those developmental skills that we're talking about across time at their level, we just look for those kids who tend to be the early maturing kids. They're, they're older and bigger in general than the other kids, so they get all the playing time. So we're not really helping them with those skills. So the, the research indicates that kids are not supposed to be playing structured activities any more hours per week than their age in years. So a 10 year old shouldn't be any more than 10 hours a week doing all these activities and they should be given time for fun. They're supposed to be given like three months off a year, uh, get at least two or three week breaks three or four times a year from the activity. And then the suggested ratio is about two to one of non-structured activities to structured activities because they too they do go together but we tend to keep them separate you know like even parents who exercise you know you drop the kids off somewhere and then you go to the gym and run on the treadmill so they're not really seeing that you value physical activity that much like just figure out some ways sometimes to bring that together recognize what the motor skills are the fundamental motor skills that kids need to learn figure out how to put those into a fun game or activity uh, with the family or just you know out with one child at a time it's a tough conversation though too, because not every community has access or has a community in which kids would feel comfortable and confident going outside and exploring and learning. So, you know, in some environments, it's really not safe to do. So you have to figure out how, how in that environment am I going to get a facility or a structure in place for kids to have that opportunity. And then that's really been, I think one of the greatest challenges because the, the areas in which we have the most kids are the areas that have the fewest opportunities sometimes. Yes. Yes. Uh, um, we're, we're based in central yes. London, fairly built up. And then there's some, some limitations there compared to when I grew up in a, as a kid, like, well, like if they want to, they can just open the back door and be like, go out there. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't currently have that uh, luxury where we're based. Um, so that's, that's a, a definitely a, a factor. Um, and I thought the, the point about people going off to the gym and maybe doing their exercise, the adults is, uh, that visibility i think that's something you take for granted you sort of get because you know you went and trained and did some exercise or perhaps you you value it highly you assume the kids know and so from my point of view before we were in lockdown i would train in the gym and the mm -hmm. kids knew that i was at the gym and daddy was doing stuff and whatever mm -hmm. that that was but they, they didn't know uh, but then all of a sudden our, our living room became the gym uh, when we were in when we were in lockdown and there was right. some equipment bought and then all of a sudden they were interested now they've got their own you know uh, my, uh, my daughter insisted on getting her own little half kilo dumbbells she's nice. she wanted to be like daddy and there's a mm -hmm. kettlebell because my wife was using that a bit uh, they've got like their own kids kettlebell and, and, and yeah they every now and again the the mood takes them they go and they're like right, what should I do with this dad what whatever but that would never have happened have we, right. you know, so you know, I suppose we're looking for for the positives out of uh, of lockdown the situation. There, there's one mm -hmm. that they've seen that, yeah. and, and right. now they're they're fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. That's great. There have been a lot of positives, I think, besides you know the being in that close space somewhat to be able to learn some of the things and learn from one another, but also to see that what was going on wasn't working. We know that our youth sports experience was not working for most kids. If that many kids are dropping out, if if by the time kids get 
uh, to an upper level. Most of them aren't doing it anymore. And we see our physical activities, physical activity in kids peaks at age six. So about, about the time they're in uh, entering primary school and then now you're in school all day, you don't have time to be outside playing and you don't get those opportunities to play anymore. And then it goes down every year after that, the more responsibilities that come on, the more things that happen. So unfortunately that's where we again show that we're not really valuing that as a society. So I think we opened up our sports to more kids and more experiences. And um, I don't know if you've had an experience like we have in the US field day where you get to go out and demonstrate your skills and different activities and, and sports and things. So we keep getting back to why don't we do that? Like, why do you have to play baseball for the entire year? Because what's happened now is parents have heard that multi-sport participation, so playing in more than one sport, helps our kids be more well-rounded than playing one sport all year. Well, instead of, like we said, you know, getting that time off and playing one sport at a time, no. They're playing three sports at the same time now. So yeah, we're doing multi-sport because we heard it's better, but they're still doing way, way, way too much work. So it's yeah. important yeah. To, to recognize that we still need to give kids time to be kids. We need to have some structure that we put in there to let them go off and, and be able to do that. Even if it's at a sporting venue, I mean, there are fields, there's an opportunity, indoor courts in, in bad weather or whatever, for kids to get together and learn how to do some of these things. The, the issue is that we have in place practice plans. So you could be a sport coach, even as a volunteer, and you could kind of get a practice plan. You could follow along with it. There's nothing that says, all right, we want you to develop your kids' fundamental movement skills, make sure they get stronger, introduce different sport skills along the way, and here's what that should look like. So there's no template that adults can really follow so much in physical education. Some programs are good and have that. Some don't. They're either sport focused or what they call lifetime fitness activity focused which means, all right, so we want you to be able to walk, run, jog, ride a bike. Like, you didn't need to learn that in phys ed. Those are just regular skills you learn as a kid. So we didn't really need phys ed to have you do those, what they call lifetime fitness activities. Kids should be able to define what that is. They should have so many skills, be exposed to so many different types of sports and activities. They can pick whatever they want to do for their lives. That doesn't happen though. <laughs> if only. <laughs> right? Um, okay, so again, a couple of, couple of points I want to follow up on. So you talked about variety, and I, I was aware of this now, the whole, like, actually, uh, you know, at, at the early age, do a variety of different sports uh, mm -hmm. and, and get exposed to those. And I, th I think the concept is, to some extent, the broader the base, the higher the peak can eventually be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's then the question, as, and I think you've, you've shown, like, you know, this sort of black and white mindset people have or the all or nothing is like oh more more's better let's do everything so right. where, where's the kind of sweet spot there in terms of how, what variety is good how much variety mm -hmm. well yeah that's a great question too because you know one of the the key tenants there's a program in the u.s um, from the aspen institute called project play and they have eight plays that they think can really reinvigorate sports programs for kids and the first play is ask the kids like, well, go figure, right? Like, no, we, we know what's best for them, but, you know, sometimes asking them, uh, I taught phys ed for a few years and the, my favorite unit was actually having them create games. So they would bring in a game they'd learned somewhere, who knows where, they just made it up. And, you know, that's where kids really learned the skills. And then they all walked away with like two or three new games they'd never heard of before that they could then take and do that. So I just think like opening up their creativity to be able to discover what is available and how to do that they'll know how much is enough and, and when to really cut back on that a little bit uh, for the variety. But again, getting back to like those fundamental motor skills and, you know, depending on which uh, source you look at, there are roughly 22 to 25 different skills uh, that then get put together one on top of another for a, for a sport. Um, what we call soccer. Uh, There's a good example for that. You know, you, you have to kick a ball and you have to run to kick the ball. Well, those are two skills that we put together but for most kids, when they're very young, they can probably run okay, but they might not have mastered kicking, especially while running, because that's a combination of skills. So how do we actually build on those skills in an environment that allows them to be successful? Uh, our adult uh, sports model kind of looks at, we only want those who can do it now, because the coach isn't measured on how well they develop the kids to get to that next level and to sign up again, it's did to win. So it, it's like this whole big, pie that has to be worked on at the same time with so many different moving parts 
So, you know, with the parents, with the kids themselves, with the coaches and the overall societal values of physical activity across the life course, sports is the vehicle for a lot of kids to get involved to do that. You know, without being introduced to some organized sports, they, they wouldn't do that. They would play video games. You know, the data suggests that over 93% of all kids play video games on a regular basis. Yeah. Okay. Well, so yeah, we're up yeah. against things there a little bit. Um, yeah. Twenty-five percent of kids never play a sport at all. As and is that you mean as in an organized team sport? It's an organized yeah. team sport. Okay. Yep. Wow. So wow. you know we have all of these conflicting messages going out there, and I think we can learn so much from video games. Like, why do they get so engaged in it? They ask the kids. They figure out like what is meaningful to you to want to get to that next level of play. So you'll keep coming back and back and back and back. Whereas our youth sports model, you know, it's, it's really that adult thing of who scored the most runs. Kids don't care, like you know, how much fun are you having? And, you know, the best way that uh, we can play a lot of those sports, play them backwards. You know, so run the bases the other direction or play the short side of the field. Now, all of a sudden, kids are like, this is pretty cool. It's different. It's interesting. So there's so many ways we can make it more creative and fun. We just choose not to. Yeah. And, and I think... The, the video game examples, uh, another another thing about that is like with a video game, uh, like an, I never, I mean, I never really played it that much, like certainly compared yeah. to your average kid, but that was more <laughs> because my dad was like, no, you are not having a games console. Um, uh, you know, and, and at the time I, I think I thought he was a terrible man, but looking back, I, I was, I, you know, it's a good, a good decision in many respects. But one of the things like from the limited exposure I've had to, obviously I've played plenty now, uh, you know, years later, but um, you, you get to a point, you can't get beyond that point because you, you're not quite good enough. You try, you fail, you work out what's wrong, you go back, you do that. And it's, it's actually, in many respects, it's like see, teaching you some really good um, strategies for other elements of life. Okay, like, well, that didn't work. It's a learning experience. What can I do? Improve. And if we could incorporate that into the experience, you know, the fun as well, but that whole, mm -hmm. that eagerness to learn and figure it out mm -hmm. and then treat, treat it as a challenge that they were excited to, then, I mean, well, then they'd be flying, right? Like kids would be, you know, all over this stuff so i suppose finding that magic formula of how do we get them engaged that way would be you know that's a sort of secret sauce or whatever but that would that, that would be really really effective i think yeah and i'll let you know if i figure it out because <laughs> yeah we all keep trying to work on it and that's one of the most difficult things i think with working with this population uh you know when you talk to uh robert lincoln for older adults there's still somewhat of a homogeneous population right you know where their age category is, where they are, what their goals are. But with kids, they're all over because along the developmental continuum, they could be biologically two to four years different than they are chronologically. So their, their growth and maturation age is so different from how old they are in years. So working with a group of nine, 10 year olds, they're all over the place. They could be six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds in terms of their maturity. So finding something that allows them to be successful really does mean that we have to engage them in the, that process because we say that sports and everything we do is really solving movement problems. So how do we create those in different ways uh, so that kids can figure that out? You know, a lot of sporting organizations and um, NGOs and NGBs have all figured out, well, at least if I put together a, a short-sighted game, that'll be better. I don't know if you've ever seen that uh, video that USA Hockey put together. They, they took the dimensions of a hockey rink and they expanded it to the adult size. So if an eight-year-old kid was on a hockey rink and as an adult, what would that look like? And it was enormous. You know, the goalies are standing there looking at the net all the way around them and they got tired just going from one end of the ice to the other. And there was no way they could set up an offense or a defense. And that really made it click for them what it's like to be a kid on these surfaces. And they said, you know what, we, there's, we have to make some changes to make this more fun. So, you know, thinking of them, making it through a kid's eyes, through their lens really does help. Yeah, I think that's a really yeah. smart move mm -hmm. just to get the adults who the people, the decision makers to see what, what they're doing. Um, that, that's brilliant. And then I know that, um, so my, my background was primarily rugby in terms of, I mean, I played like uh, actually a bunch of sports as a kid, but it's the one I ended up uh, focusing on. But my first exposure to that playing when I was about seven, rather than a full pitch, we, and I, when I was showing up to the game, I, you know, first training session, I figured we'd be on a full pitch and, you know, cause I just seen it on TV, but it was called mini rugby. And it was like, they'd sectioned off a bit of the pitch and you were playing on maybe a third of the size of the pitch or something. Right. I don't know. Um, right. But, but football as in, so soccer, uh, mm -hmm. it took, 
we had five a side, which is a specific thing, a small pitch, mm -hmm. there's five, only five of you. But for a long time, you played on men's, like, because there's only so many pitches around. We were playing on the men's pitch with men's mm -hmm. size goals with like yeah. eight year olds. Right. Um, and, and it's madness now you look back and one of the reasons that perhaps the British teams didn't develop and the technique uh, for a period of time lagged behind lots of other countries in Europe was because this, I mean, and then because it rewarded the, the, the biggest, fastest, fittest kids who could kick mm -hmm. the ball the furthest because they could basically kick it and chase it and yep. they weren't developing any skills. Right. Um, so, so I think I love that example of putting that, because, um, you know, you, you could as an adult, you kind of go, oh yeah, this looks kind of big for my eight-year-old, but until you see it, Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. scale to yourself I think that's that's that really brings it home and the other thing yeah. you talked about biological versus chronological so which I think is a uh, you know an, an interesting topic and something probably a lot of people you know not not in the field like yourself mm -hmm. you know, don't take for granted don't consider um yeah. and and so the example I can think of here which tries to address that in some respects is in New Zealand the way they uh, organize their rugby so mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this but they they play uh, up until a certain age it's in it's in weight category, uh, not in in age within within a band. I think they have like a couple of years or whatever. So, but yeah. so because it's such a physical sport that if mm -hmm. you have a, a kid that matures early, they mm -hmm. can just run over people. But then they're not developing the skills, and then yeah. uh, they maybe when everyone else catches up, they suddenly disappear. And so that's one of the ways they address it, uh, which I thought was was an excellent uh, excellent yeah. approach. And actually, yeah. they are yeah. the, yeah. they're the best team in the world at rugby. And there's probably <laughs> some small part of it is. Is down to that so mm -hmm. could you explain for the listener chronological versus biological age mm -hmm. uh just just to make sure everyone's uh you know understanding what that means yeah yeah chronological age is how long since you were born so you know um if you have an eight-year-old kid he was born eight years ago or she was born eight years ago biological age is kind of this combination of their overall maturity levels and their physical development. So we have all different types of ages. Actually, we have our psychological age, you know, how, how ready we are to listen and follow directions and resolve conflicts and that sort of thing. And our, our biological ages, maturationally, biologically, how are we growing toward uh, being a, an adult person? So we can measure and track that, uh, which a lot of our European countries do a much better job than we do here. So uh, tracking injury rates, because as kids go through that adolescent growth spurt, there's a much higher increase in, in risk of injury. So looking at those differences, we can't think that all 12 year olds are like every other 12 year old. And, and it, that the, the average girl reaches maturity around age 12, the average, the average boy around age 14, but there's a gap on either side of that. So not recognizing that you might think that kid who's 13 years old is ready for something that he or she is not. They have not reached that maturity level yet. And yet we're imposing that on them. And that's why a lot of the benchmarks that we have for performance don't really hold up because depending on where you are along that developmental continuum, I was the classic uh, late mature. So I didn't really hit uh, maturity until like 17. <laughs> I was really far behind in, in my growth pattern at least. So I, I feel how this works as I went through it myself um, to see that you could re you miss a lot of kids. So I know Malcolm Gladwell in his book put together a lot of that information, you know, and showed that, gosh, if you really let those kids who don't mature at the first earliest level and you give them a chance, they're the ones that end up holding most of the records in professional sports later on. So we need to make sure that as a coach, we're not saying, gosh, you know, I just want my best kids out here right now because I need to win or they won't hire me back. So we have to change that mindset too. So all these mindsets we have to fix. Yes. So yes. that's a <laughs> crucial one. Uh, the, the coach's mindset of what, what, what's my role here? Is my role here to get the best winning percentage for the season or is it to develop these kids to be the best well, athlete and or specific sports player. Uh, and and, and well, I suppose that they have to, mm -hmm. number one, well, answer that question themselves, but also whoever's organizing the, the bigger structure that they're working within, what do we right. want out of you? And, and, and that's a different thing. Um, the Malcolm Gladwell point was a good one because I've, I've read, I believe it was in Outliers. Mm -hmm. uh, he was talking about that. And I think it's the ice hockey. If you want to be born in September, I'm, I'm thinking um, <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's like the time to be, to be born and a huge percentage of, NHL, uh, you know, right. players are, are that time time of year, and from a personal perspective, uh, playing international age group rugby, uh, I was born in April, but the season ran is a school year, so September uh, through to August. So I was, you know, middle of the year, say, 
Um, mm -hmm. And then when you left school, uh, the under 19 shifted and it was January to January. So all of a sudden now it was April. I was that there was all those kids that, had, you know, were, uh, you know, born if, you know, the year before me, but this in, in terms of an actual, like not the actual year, but, but the, the, not the school year. And now I was that little bit older within the cohort or whatever. And right. all, all of a sudden, you know, I was, I went from being on the bench to starting now. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's just a personal example, but True. It's, it, it, it's one of those ones though, again, though, early on you show promise and then it becomes a, a positive upward spiral for that individual or self-fulfilling prophecy because more resources go into coaching them, they get more exposure, they improve, but where they, and they separate, there's like a, I imagine there's a bit of a fork in the road potentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then no more gifted naturally, mm -hmm. they've, they've just had more exposure, potentially better coaching or whatever. Theoretically. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. there's, that, there's, 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 there's more exposure. We'll go with that. More they exposure, played, <laughs> yeah, more exposure, yeah, yeah more practice. <laughs> not necessarily quality or, or, mm. uh, of practice um yeah. i believe and i may be mixing books because it was a while ago but I, i'm fairly certain also in that book though he talked about uh kids that are born later in the school year that do okay up until they hang in there their 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 ability is good enough to hang in there until mm -hmm. they reach maybe same when they're 17 18 and they they're doing heart moving towards higher education those kids that are late in the year, then they suddenly flourish because they've learned all the coping mechanisms and strategies to play catch up. But when they finally, that gap is closed, they flourish. So do we see, or, or in, are there any sports in particular, we see a similar trend with that. Whereas, you know, the, the, the star uh, uh, who was 13 uh, suddenly drifts off and, and these kids, you know, the late bloomers for want of a better phrase, suddenly mm -hmm. are able to show their abilities. Well, there are a lot more stories about the Michael Jordans and Tom Brady's of the world who were in those categories. You know, they, they weren't where everybody would have expected they would be at the level they played as a professional as there are the Tiger Woods stories. So, you know, everybody saw that story and said, oh my gosh, look what he can do. He's only four, he's on Johnny Carson. So I have to get my kid playing right now. Uh, whereas what they really showed was that, and you're right, because for those kids who mature a little bit later, they still have for what for them when you're talking about you know playing in just a little bit outside your comfort zone for those kids who are really good already they're not really learning all that much because they're the good ones but for the the other ones who are catching up they're just outside of that comfort zone so they have to be challenged a little bit to improve their skills to get to that level so you're right if they can hang in there psychologically uh, and not get cut from the team and not get discouraged and leave that generally they outperform those who matured early later on in their athletic careers. Yeah, yeah that's, that's that's very so interesting. interesting. Um, so uh, we talked, we, you know, we're talking about competition a little bit here. So then there's a question that's, that sprang to mind is at what age should we be having competition? How, is there a period of time uh, or, you know, in general, we're doing bro broad brushstrokes here that it should be all about the engaging enjoyment, fun, learning basic core skills before they're actually uh, in, involved in com competing. Um, I suppose I'm thinking, as you said, there's a psychological development. So dealing mm -hmm. with loss and also the, <laughs> having been a kid who had to play these things, the tactical coaching you're getting when you're nine, and I'm just not sure I was there to, to compute that at all <laughs> and be like, know what, know what the coach was trying to tell me about this formation or whatever. Um, so is, is there sort of a timeline that you, you think, okay, up until this stage, really we want to focus on developing skills and, and getting enjoyment before we put competition in? The real question therefore is competing in what? So are you getting back to what you're saying before? All right, we have this adult model. If you look at how most sports are set up for kids, they follow an adult model. So we always say the kids shouldn't be miniature adults, but what do we do? We made the ball smaller. We made the field smaller. Uh, maybe we play a little less time than we did for the adult uh, game. Maybe we have somewhat fewer games throughout the season, but it's the same season. It's the same model. So the natural level of competition then is the contest to see who wins. We don't have to set it up like that. We can set up challenges. So it's like, all right, so, you know, let, let's take an example of a sport where you have to throw an implement. Can you throw different size implements? Can they be different textures? Can it be a static target, a large target, a far target, a moving target? So when you really look at how you would set up fundamental motor skills for kids to learn, can you set up these type of challenges? And, and then you can really track how kids are progressing through these skills and then put it into some type of a game situation 
I'm not an advocate that says that, you know, kids shouldn't be competing with one another until they reach a certain age. That's the other challenge we have with kids. Some kids thrive on it early on, some kids don't. So when we look at it, when we stop giving kids opportunities to meet them where they are because of some other social norm we decide on, they're missing out. So how can you set up the competition so that it's fun? Because, you know, at the end of the day, there's always the most fearful time for kids is always that car ride home after the contest because they know their parents are going to be, oh, you know, the official stinks, the other team did this, and you were the best, and, but you missed out. And so let's talk about that, the whole car ride home. And the kid's like, man, can I just have dinner? So <laughs> to the kid, once that game is over, it's over. They don't absorb, they don't keep it in. They're ready for the next big thing. And that's what helps to keep it fun. But once we take that away and show how much that competition really met, and you know, there are always those stories that, you know, if you see a team goes out and gets a pizza after a game and they have their uniforms on, you know, somebody walks up to the team, they don't say, hey, did you have a good time? Are you learning? Are you developing? Do, what, what's, the, what's your favorite thing about football? No. Did you win? That's the first thing that we ask. So that's our cultural comparison that we use, unfortunately. But I think if we change that around, you could still have games and contests, but within an overall larger framework of different types of challenges so that you're always doing that because school is like that. You know, we don't prepare for the one big exam. <laughs> Some countries actually do, right? So, you know, your lot in life is determined by one exam, usually by the time you're like 16, 17 years old. Unfortunate, because that's a whole nother stressor that doesn't really show to have a huge success either. You know, in school, usually you'll have all different types of ways to get measured throughout the year and you get told how you did, but not in front of everybody else. <laughs> So we need to figure out how we can do that for kids at all different levels, make it challenging, increasing their ability to perform these motor skills, doing different things, and it's fun. It's, it'd be more fun for parents too. Yeah, I think that's uh, really good, uh, you know, very, very wise. Um, and actually, as you're talking about things, I'm thinking about like terrible, you know, things like, oh, we can't believe we, you know, they were making us do that. But actually sometimes oh, that was brilliant. So for example, again, when I talked about when I started playing rugby, out of every month we'd probably have or maybe it was more like six weeks whatever but it was like we'd play matches against other teams two weeks uh and then we'd have a, a it was just like training for a couple of weeks and then we'd have this like challenge uh but it was like a skills challenge so you had to do uh kicking for like a target kicking to hit uh some uh, something else uh right. catching passing left hand right hand hitting targets whatever and then but then there was like you know there was an element of competition though because there was like a pointing a point system and then there was uh they didn't kind of just have like the leaderboard top and bottom but they were like you either got a gold uh like uh, i don't know i can't think it's not a rosette but anyway some kind of badge uh and then you had these different things so you know there was an element of oh like my mate tom's got a silver and i'm a bronze or whatever so there's a little bit of competition which definitely we i remember thinking what's What's, what, what are they doing? What are they, are they getting there? <laughs> but, but, but it was focusing on the skills as well. So now I'm thinking that was, that was great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely it is. So, you know, it's unfortunate we don't do more of that for kids at all the different levels so that they can grow and expand. Um, I ran the middle school. So those are kids roughly you know, 12, 13, 14, the athletic program in Philadelphia. And one of the things we did is we combined their, um, their skills package their, their team participation when they played other schools and their academics. So their standings were actually based on all of those, not just one thing. So you could have a team that's six and zero, oh, but you know, their, the grade point average is 2.0 and they're, they're, they're like, why are we in fourth place? So it's an academic setting. So how are you tying all of those things that you're, you say you value into your measuring system? Because we're not doing it that way. There's that old expression, you know, what, get, what's get, what gets measured gets managed, but we're not measuring the right thing. So yeah, we're managing the wrong thing because we're measuring we're measuring it incorrectly. So lots of opportunity. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I think that's really, really good uh, way, way to combine things. And again, as you said, what, what do we value when we, we make that, you know, the, then we have outcomes based on what we, mm -hmm. we value, um, mm -hmm. which, which is excellent. Um, okay, again, so, well, a little bit selfish because we're thinking, okay, like how can I help my kids? Now, when you were, you were talking, you took, gave the example of soccer, uh, kicking a ball, running, running and kicking a ball. I mentioned how that's a combination. That's difficult. Now, again, uh, John Wooden, the mm -hmm. sort of famous basketball coach, I remember reading stuff about him. One of the things is he, he had like, I don't even know if he maybe named it, the whole part whole model. He seems to be, I th I'm thinking, right. Mm -hmm. and, no, so if I'm trying to teach them or get them, you know, there's a new skill we're looking at. 
it's, it seemed to me that that, that was like, you know, you, you, you know, demo maybe the right movement, break that down into chunks, show what could go wrong, how you can fix it, let them have a go and explore with that, leave them to it and maybe then offer uh, some points, you know, like if, if you think you can, can add any value. Mm -hmm. Now, that all seemed pretty logical to me. Does, does that hold true? Is that a good way? And, and maybe what are some of the other ways we can, we can help them develop skills like that? That's a great point too, because that, that model is still very often used. And we kind of look at with the interrelatability of the parts of that model. So is it a skill that you can only do as one big skill? So, you know, we usually look at the exercise world, you know, you don't break down the different parts of a squat. Right? You, you go down, you, pull, you come back up, it's one motion, but Olympic lifts like the snatch, for example, or the clean, you could break that down into its subcomponents. So that could work for a part whole model rather than whole parts. So, and then within the part practice model, there's all different ways of putting those together. So combining one skill and another skill, you can either master those two together before you move on to the next one, or you can do them in different sequences. Because you know, in, in game situations, you don't know how it's going to come. You might have to kick the ball, then run to it and kick it again. So if you're not practicing it that way, you're missing that particular skill. There's a great cartoon that I have somewhere. It's these girls standing around these orange cones and they're doing everything they should be doing with all these drills. And the next slide shows them out on a game and the other girls are running all around and go, coach, this isn't how we practiced it. So you know, are you putting it together in those type of movement situations to work? The one thing I like, it's uh, the Positive Coaching Alliance. They're out in California. They have what they call the compliment sandwich. And I like the way they do that because the like, let's say for example, um, that an athlete is running toward the soccer ball, but gets beat by the defender from behind. And they say, you know, I really like the way you hustled and you knew exactly where the ball is. Why do you think you missed it? So you start engaging the athlete in the process. You're not telling them everything. Like, why did you miss it? They'll tell you like, yeah, I heard the footsteps behind me coach. And all of a sudden I, I focused on that and I lost the ball and, and she got it away from me. And then the next part is, all right, what should you do now? So, well, I, I should block that out and just run toward the ball. The research says that you should go practice that like five, seven times in a row so that that becomes the skill that you remember, not that you missed the ball. Because usually what happens, a coach will say, well, go sit down or go run a lap. So all the wrong things that don't help the kids ever learn the skill. So we have to figure out, all right, you missed it, but how do I help you learn that and be successful with it? So the next time the ball is there, you're not gonna slow down and lose your confidence in getting to it because that's what happened last time. So no matter which one of those practice models we use, unless we're really bringing the kids in and helping them to learn from it, you know, we wouldn't do that. Well, sometimes we do it in school, right? So you get your quiz back and you got a four out of 10, but they don't tell you what you did wrong. <laughs> you don't learn it. So it's kind of what we do out on the athletic field, right? We give you a four out of 10 and that's it. You move on to the next subject or the next lesson. So we need to fix that. When you put it like that, it makes perfect sense. And actually there's a teacher, really, a really great teacher uh, uh, with my kids. And one of the most important questions, like he, he, he turns it around to them. He's like, well, what do you think? And like gets them to explore. Okay, well, yeah. And again, uh, it creates that situation where right. it's okay to be, you know, to be wrong. Uh, it's not, you know, you're, you're not failing, you're learning that, that whole yeah. approach, but yeah. um, rather than just giving them the answer. And I suppose, you know, like that would be something that I, I'm sure I would be guilty of. Like if my, my son's <laughs> trying to throw a ball, my daughter's trying to catch one. I'm like, no, no, it's like, 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 like this, but yeah. okay. Like get, get them to think it through and, and engage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's definitely a great tip. So I'll, that's, that's one key takeaway for me. I'm going to, I'm going to use yeah. the wall. What do you think? And uh... what do you think? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. You know, it's interesting because as parents, we, we want our kids to do it right. And so we want to step up and say, all right, so your foot should be here. Make sure your body's over this way. And, and, you know, unfortunately for a lot of parents who are trying to do that, you might not have learned correctly. I don't know if you remember that Volkswagen commercial from a number of years ago. And the kid's throwing the ball with his right hand, but his right foot is forward too. And the dad say, well, great job. And he throws it back to him the same way. He didn't learn it correctly. So we, we do need to, and I think that's one of the reasons that parents are sometimes reluctant to be part of their kids' lives with these movements because they didn't really learn them well. You can always learn them. You know, there's, there's always time to learn that. And I, I strongly encourage adults to learn that because as a personal trainer, when I do training, my philosophy was always that a lot of my clients were those who never really learned those skills confidently. So, you know, the first time I get the medicine ball out to do a med ball drill, the first thing my client does, is they go like this, right? They're like, oh, don't throw me that ball. They roll it to me. You know, so I actually have, I teach them throwing and catching so that they're comfortable doing that. 
So I always encourage parents to actually learn those, work on them. There, there's nothing that says you have to be an expert at it. We've all had that experience with fourth grade math. <laughs> so, so, you know, all of a sudden there's this problem you're like, why are you, they're learning in a complete different way from how we did. And that's okay. You, you figure it out. So we should figure out how to do the skills too. Yeah, actually, the, the point you make about when you're doing some personal training is a good one as well. Because I've, I've, I've coached people over the years and you, you know, you pretty quickly see like, okay, they, they, they really like, you know, they, they don't know how to move in, in space. They have no body awareness. Uh, and, and you like, you know, like start asking about their background and stuff. And, you know, there's, I've, I've had guys that are literally there. Well, they're incredible uh, academics, and but they have basically been chained to books and computers their whole life. And they've been mm -hmm. very successful at that, but they've, they've never done this stuff. So it was all new to them and then which was well you know meant we had to to build things up but the other thing was that they were able to develop those capacities it wasn't like oh you know it, or it, it you know you you have to know this by the time you're six i'm sure it it helps right but mm -hmm. but they were skills that they could develop so sure oh yeah they do say though if you remember Vern seafeld's proficiency barrier from way back in the early 80s uh he looked at motor skills almost like we look at reading in school that you know, if you're not at grade level reading by around age 10 or 11, they saw the same thing for fundamental movements because if you don't really move well by that age, we have to kind of give you remedial attention to help bring that up. Otherwise, you're not going to be an elite level mover. You'll still be able to move. You'll still be able to read. But, you know, so I think a lot of times when we take coaching and what we do and we bring it back and relate it back to academics, it's something that everybody remembers. They, they knew what it was like to, to have those experiences. And, uh, so if we just isolate sports, sometimes it's harder to do that. Um, we've talked about sort of uh, some foundational movements and things like that uh, as, a, as a broad term. And I suppose I have in my mind what they are. But for mm -hmm. the listener, uh, mm -hmm. can you identify some, I think you said there's maybe up to 25. So I don't expect to reel yeah. off all of those, but some key things so people are, are understanding what, what maybe they want uh, their, their, you know, their youngsters to be looking at. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. There are three main categories. So we have a body awareness. So, you know, being able to roll, balance, know where your body is in space, all of those different things that, that we do that way. Uh, then we have other things in another category where we learn to throw and catch and strike and hit. So it's object control. So can we actually do those type of motions? Uh, the main category that most people remember is the locomotor category. So uh, running, skipping, hopping, jumping, and, and that type of thing. So all these motor skills are in different categories. Uh, so you talked about the soccer and the running and the kicking. Those are motor skills in two different categories. So you have object control and um, lo locomotor skills. So then you can start putting them together in different ways. Uh, there was a paper that came out a few years ago, and they also said that we should really also focus on foundational movement skills. So those skills that everybody should have, swimming, riding a bike, squatting, lunging. So, you know, our, our primal movements. So you have some type of a hinge, a squat, a lunge, a push, a pull, a brace and a rotate and a carry. So I know Robert Lincoln puts his programs together using those movements. So those are really, really important because if you start doing that, you really now are tying that cradle to grave. Now those, you've learned those at an early age and you're carrying them all the way through. Robert and I actually did a presentation a few years ago at a conference of what that would look like across the age spectrum so that you learn those similar skills no matter what level you are so that you can always apply them. I still put motor skills training into uh, whatever age athlete or client I work with. They're still important and they're still trainable. And they say that even with elite level athletes, go back and, and do those, see what they look like. I was at a conference a number of years ago with uh, physical education people uh, and they gave us a movement break, which they always encourage you to take a movement break, right? So somebody came in to lead this break and they said, all right, everybody skip around the, around the room. It was horrible. But that was nothing compared to when they said, all right, now gallop. <laughs> oh my goodness. So there must've been 60, 70 people in the room. I'll bet only five could gallop. So even those who are in the physical education world didn't keep practicing that movement to be able to do it. So it, it, I think it's incumbent on us to, to keep wanting to move. So create that culture where everybody wants to move and starts to feel comfortable and confident in it. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's a, to some extent that use it or lose it principle. I mean, you, you, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's much easier to maintain something than it is also to develop it. So if you've developed it early, just, you know, you, you, right. can, you can hang on to that if you, if you pepper it in there and, and keep it as part of the, uh, the, you know, the process. That, that makes sense. And I think it's, you know, a real valuable takeaway I'll be uh, I'll be applying with some of my some of my clients. Uh, cool. you know, so I mean, I, like the chat with Robert was great. So I've got 
uh, a couple of clients around like this the 70 years old mark so there was obviously some useful stuff there but a bunch of the stuff he told me i was like well these 40 guys 40 year old guys this definitely applies to them so, so i think that this chat's been brilliant as well because i definitely i was guilty of coming in thinking we're talking about youth athletes here but mm -hmm. there's, it's, it's that much bigger picture which i'm really pleased that we've had this chat so i can see it that way right cool well, i appreciate that too so that's really one of the tough parts that we have is that you know at the the youth developmental level uh, some people either think this model is only for kids or only for athletes and they think that athlete is only an elite athlete we're all athletes. You know, you go back to that original definition of what we're looking at here. Um, you have your Nike gear on. Dan Bowerin from Nike, he defined an athlete as anybody with a body. We're all athletes. It's just, you know, how we choose to express that, but it doesn't mean that it has to be that elite performer. So we, we really talked about athleticism, which is really the ability to move confidently with grace and poise in a variety of situations with a variety of equipment so that you can create that menu of whatever you want to do to be a mover for the rest of your life. And it doesn't mean that just because you do one thing, you can't try something else. Mm -hmm. Yes, brilliant. Well, I think like, well, that wraps things up perfectly. Eh? Yeah, that's 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 a, uh, a lovely way for, to end in terms of a, sort of a summary of, of how important this is uh, and, and how how you can incorporate it. Um, so I think there's you know, a ton of value for, for everyone listening, whether it be training their own kids, they actually coach youngsters, they're coaching you know, young adults, adults mm -hmm. older adults that whole spectrum so i think that that's been brilliant to get that that perspective as well so i'm, I'm very pleased with that so thank you very much for that um i, I want to give you a chance to tell everyone where they can find out a bit about you and what you do and, and, and how they can learn more about this topic but before we do i uh, I, I mentioned i had a few questions i ask everyone so mm -hmm. there's a there's a few either or uh nice simple uh, you know choices for you to make um and so let's crack on with those quickly um okay. so Pizza or burger? Pizza. Chocolate or peanut butter? Chocolate. Beach holiday or a city break? Beach. Uh, steak rare or well done? Uh, oh, that's a tough one because it's in the middle. Uh, all right, all right. We'll let you get away with that. We'll let, you know, that <laughs> one changed because when we grew up, rare was what they now consider medium. Yeah, so it's, it's, you had to shift it because it's by temperature, not by color anymore. So, yeah, I, to answer that question, I go with rare. OK, all right. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, I think that's a, a, a fair answer. I'll, 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 I'll take that as an answer. I, right. I, I, someone told me the other day that I'm, I'm, I managed to look relatively neutral until it gets to that question. And if anyone <laughs> if anyone says, well done, I'm just sort of I can't I can't hide in my disgust. So. <laughs> That's right. We're yeah, well, we're not broadcasting this interview. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cancel. Um, all right, last one. And, and you can tell I'm a bit food focused with these questions too as well, right? <laughs> so uh, scrambled or poached eggs? Scrambled. With, okay, with cool. Cheese. Nice, nice. I mean, <laughs> everything's better with cheese. Um, okay. okay, so this question, the one that gets people thinking and stumps them for a little bit is, tell me something about yourself uh, that people probably don't already know about you. People don't know about me. Hmm, that's a darn good question. Yeah, this is the one, wow. this always gets people thinking. Uh, <laughs> but it does, it does also sometimes produce very interesting answers. Yeah, so I'm trying to think it's because this, this question has come up and you know, just trying to think of something that people don't know about me generally. Mm. I guess the majority of people don't know that I'm a competitive strong man. Oh, there you go. So that would be somewhat that's a little different. And I always joke because I'm in the master's category and that doesn't mean I'm an expert. It just means I'm old. <laughs> so the master's category is by age, not necessarily by skill, but uh, it, it revolutionized the way that I train because I've been training and working out since I was young. And so, you know, you, you go, all right, squat day, which kind of squat are we going to do? I'm like, all right, it was, I still did it because I still love working out. But Strongman just really changed the way I look at training and what I do. Oh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Um, I interviewed Odd Hogan. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, yeah. End of last year. Mm -hmm. Great interview again. And, and, and a really lovely guy. But took mm -hmm. you know, and, and probably the world's strongest 70 year old uh, right. uh yeah. but 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 fascinating so yeah strongman what uh, mm -hmm. well maybe we'll have to get you on to have a quick chat about about your experience with that another time because uh sure, it's it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's it, I, I find it really really interesting to talk to people mm -hmm. that have competed in, in it at, at various um points in their life as well because mm -hmm. it's, it's one of these ones that the, the masters uh, events really seem to be to be taking off and that again talking about this cradle to grave thing that's like brilliant that people are yeah. uh, you know uh, are training that what is it when you say masters what's what's the cut uh, the, the, the cut of how old 
Uh, it's Unfortunately, a, it's a uh, for the contest that I participated in now, it's 40 and older. Oh, wow. I, uh, <laughs> that doesn't feel like it's that, that doesn't that, feel like that much of a master's. I feel, I feel they should make it a little bit. No, more. but there aren't enough people to compete in it yet right. to really have the different grades. So, you know, it's usually if there's more than five of us, it's a miracle. But there's usually four or five of us who compete. My, my dogs are, are excited about it, too. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Strong man, they're, they're suddenly engaged. Yeah, so yeah, they were quiet for the most part, so that was pretty good. Yeah, they're very well behaved. Yeah, so it's just that at that level, and the weights we use now in a strongman contest are very comparable to what the world's strongest man weights were in the early days of the world's strongest man. So I'll watch them do these things. I'm like, I could do that. I'm like, it's pretty cool to see how it's really evolved over the years. And yeah. Yeah. Like, to see what those guys do now is just unbelievable how much they can do it incredible but yeah interesting you said like masters like 40 plus because yeah well uh, i would say strongman in some sense it's like an, it's an older athlete sport it, or historically has been like the top guys in the world are that bit that bit older it takes time to yeah, develop that that level of, of strength but interestingly i have an interview lined up with uh, alexei novikov who sort of oh, wow. flips that on his head the other way because uh, he's mm. i believe currently 24 and world's strongest man so he's he's uh <laughs> he's definitely uh, changed things there but um yeah. Yeah, well, I like masters at forty. That I was, uh, that that's blown my mind. Like, it feels it feels like there's a lot of guys who are just reaching their peak not far off that age. So there's, there's oh, yeah. some cra crazy numbers be uh, be right. moved around. Well, absolutely, there is. And the cool part though is that you'll be doing something in a contest, and you'll hear the younger competitors going, "Wow, my dad couldn't do that." <laughs> like, oh, okay, I guess thanks. <laughs> For my grandfather, <laughs> grandfather in my case, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> a lot I'll, older than most of the competitors. I'll take that compliment, but it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's uh, not, a bit of a backhanded one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. So. Um, okay, so final final question for me um, is, uh, if I could interview anyone, so that question I, I gave you the heads up on earlier, I have mm -hmm. a, a dress book with all the contacts uh, uh, in it. Who should I interview next? Uh, based on our conversation, what we're talking about, I probably would recommend Steve Boyle. Okay. Who runs an organization called 241 Sports, uh, which he, he has two daughters, and his daughters gave the company the name because they said life is too short for just one sport. So when we talk about like what that model would be and how you would put that together. He's done that. So he has like six or seven different cities that he goes to now, and he puts together these multi-sport camps and how that works. And, and he includes the social emotional part of it too. So it's not just the sports part. He puts all of it together and, and kids love it. So I presented with him before. And I, I would probably recommend him, I think, is first on my list. Okay, fantastic. Well, I might have to uh, try and try and get an email uh, address from you for, to, to make that happen. But that sounds that sounds like an excellent yeah. interview. Very, very interesting. Um, Rick, so thank you very much. A uh, ton of value there. Really appreciated yeah. your time. Please take a little moment now to let people know where they can find out a little bit more about uh, you know you the writing you've got uh you know various websites and, and you know there's some some other podcasts out there and, and that sort of thing you know i should probably put all that together at some point in time and you know i've, I've thought about maybe this is the year that i do that and I, I put it all together in one spot um i helped to write the national strength and conditioning association's position statement on long-term athletic development so if, if you google that if you google me a lot of that stuff will will turn up um all of my social media is under R.I. Howard 41. So, you know, whether you want to find me on Facebook or uh, Twitter, Instagram, or um, even LinkedIn, it's all the same name. I also run for the National Strength and Conditioning Association. We have a Facebook page for long-term athletic development. So if you look for NSCA, LTAD, Special Interest Group, or SIG, that'll come up. So we have uh, close to 8,000 people on that page who talk about you know, this growth and development, cradle to grave, sports participation stuff from all over the world. So it, it's fascinating. And we have parents, coaches, athletes, practitioners, researchers. So it's a really great group of people who kind of share their thoughts and views on different topics. Uh, so you always find me there. Uh, other podcasts, I, I guess one that uh, we're probably proud of is uh, John O'Sullivan, who runs the Changing the Game Project, who would also be another good guest. Uh, he had us on his podcast a couple of years ago. He called it like a fireside chat. <laughs> so it's just casual conversation with Joe Eisenman, Tony Marino, and I. The three of us created what we call 
uh, LTAD playgrounds where we go into different communities. We get community leaders in the space together. Um, show what it could look like, how it can, how it is being implemented in different parts of the community, and then how to put it all together to make it accountable within that community. So if you look up LTAD playground. Brilliant. 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 Okay, so we'll, we'll make sure we get the uh, in the show notes the the links to those places so people can go check that out and and, and learn a bit more uh, and give that other podcast uh, you know episode a listen. So um, for now, though, Rick, that's uh, that's that's all from me. And thank you very much again for, for taking the time to chat. Um, you know, ho hopefully we'll get on and, and talk about Strongman another time. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks so much, Tom. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to your listeners. That wraps up today's episode. Thank you so much for investing your time with us. We really appreciate it. If you enjoyed what you heard and took value from it, please do me a favor by heading to iTunes right now, subscribing to the show and leaving a review. Positive reviews, you know, like five stars, hint, hint, really help the ranking of the show and will help us to spread the word and keep getting top class guests on. Make sure to follow Breaking Muscle on social media and me at Tom McCormick, that's T-O-M-M-A-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K on Instagram. Bye for now, and I'm looking forward to catching you on the next episode of the Breaking Muscle podcast.